Thank you for attending uh, Strategies for Implementing and Tracking a Multi-Channel Program. Uh, why is this important to an affiliate manager? Even if, let's say, you're only responsible for managing affiliate marketing, you still need to understand how your channel is being measured uh, across you know, the entire enterprise and how it's being stacked against other marketing channels. If you're an affiliate, well, you need to understand how advertisers are looking at attribution to make sure that you're getting you know, the, the proper fractional attribution and, and be able to negotiate appropriately. Uh, and if you're a marketing manager responsible for multiple channels, well, you'll want to learn about best practices for how to implement uh, tag management and attribution modeling, as well as hear about some of the, the common pitfalls. My name is Adam Glazer. I am the president and founder of Partner Commerce. We're a performance marketing agency that uh, manages affiliate search and display campaigns for B2B advertisers. Because we manage campaigns across multiple channels, we've turned to Impact Radius to uh, leverage their platform for partnership management, tag management, and attribution modeling. We're lucky today to have Todd Crawford with us. He's the co-founder of Impact Radius and runs their strategic initiatives. Uh, having built this technology and deployed it successfully across uh, countless organizations, he's really a wealth of knowledge on the topic. And I think as a, as a third party that sits in between the advertiser, the agency, and the affiliate, he has a unique and, and independent perspective uh, from all angles. I'm going to ask him today a series of questions and then give you a chance to ask some as well. Um, before I do, I want to give Todd a, a minute to introduce himself uh, and make some opening remarks. Thanks. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I, I was also part of the founding team at Commission Junction from 98 until 2006, and then from there I helped found or get One Network Direct uh, kind of created and going at uh, Digital River. And then we started Impact Radius in 2008 and launched it in 2010. And again, as Adam said, you know, really what we're trying to do here is help everyone understand some of the complexities and pitfalls of having a multi-channel strategy and how, you know, you can best, you know, defend uh, uh, possible uh, decisions or analysis of data outside of the affiliate network or the affiliate platform reporting that you're used to using if you're either the affiliate or the, the uh, advertiser managing the affiliate program. A lot of organizations have more um, high-level data that they're looking at, and we'll go through some of that. And it's really important to be able to be familiar with that data and understand really the true value of the affiliate channel down to the individual affiliates. Just out of curiosity, show of hands, who uh, in this room is a uh, advertiser that's responsible for managing multiple channels, multiple, multiple marketing channels? Okay. And, and are there some folks in here who are just affiliate managers that just manage affiliate? Okay. And do we have any actual affiliates? All right, awesome. All right, so Todd, let me ask you, I mean, where do I begin? Right. I think the best plan uh, when you're either working with other departments or um, looking at this yourself is you've really got to create a blueprint. You've got to know kind of all the moving pieces. And there's a lot of different departments involved usually, right, within your organization, different stakeholders. There's different sometimes third parties like agencies and even different technology vendors. And because there's gonna be a lot of communication between them, if you don't have a blueprint where you kind of dial in all the moving pieces so that everybody's looking at the same information, it's the first and easiest place to screw this up. It really happens very easily. So, you know, the main thing, we'll go through this, but you wanna identify all the channels that are important to you. And typically those channels are things that you can influence the customer's, you know, conversions, you know, sales or leads that you're looking at and then look at how those are integrated now or need to be integrated to give you accurate data. And then probably most critical or equally critical is what, which tool, and you're gonna have multiple tools, uh, reporting systems, is gonna be the one that you're all gonna agree is right. Because as you'll see, and I'll point out, and you probably already know, that they're not all gonna give you the same data. So let's, let's just look at the simplest thing to do is identify your marketing channels. Now these are the most channels that most people are very familiar with. What a lot of people miss out is kind of direct or undefined. And that's kind of a catch-all bucket when you get a lot of traffic from things that you weren't expecting or somebody, another department starts to market. You need a way to catch that and identify it and then obviously define it later. The other thing I would point out is that 
these are not individual channels as, as much anymore because if you're doing SEO, you might be doing it uh, across, you know, you have SEO across multiple search engines, SEM across multiple search engines. You could be running on multiple affiliate networks, but most importantly, you want to look at individual affiliates. So you can't really bucket those as solid channels. Um, you know, retargeting, you could be doing multiple retargeting campaigns. So again, there's got to be granularity in that as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm using Google Analytics and Webmaster Tools to measure my SEO. I've got a bid management system tracking my search marketing. Uh, I'm, I'm in CJ, I'm in Linkshare, I'm in Impact Radius, I'm in multiple networks for affiliate. And like you said, I could be working with multiple vendors for retargeting. Every single report that I look at gives me a different result. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what am I doing wrong? Well, there's a couple things that happen and you know, a lot, the, the, probably the other thing that I think people kind of skip over is they don't take a step back and go, okay, all these things are integrated and tracking right now and we've got all these tools to report, but how are they integrated? What, how do we track them? What, what is there, is, is there um, pixels involved, third-party tags? Are we using name value pairs like you would in your analytics, you know, UTM underscore source equals blah? You know, take that moment to really dive in and understand how everything is integrated and tracked. Are there conditional um, pixel firing rules? Because when you do that, you're letting these v disparate uh, third party tools capture the data themselves and then you may have a master or several solutions um, that are also looking at this data and they never match up. And a lot of the reason is some of the products that you're using don't track as well or they are being used in a way that they're maybe not built for. The other common thing is that you take an affiliate program that might have a 30-day cookie window. So if a, an affiliate's a last click within 30 days, they get credit. But your analytics tool might be looking at that as session-based. So it's going to totally have a different count based on the affiliate network when it sees that UTM underscore and tries to mm -hmm. record the same data. The other thing that happens is the conditional pixel firing can also miss sales because the logic is wrong. And you can also, um, well, I, we'll hold back on that last part. So these are things that you need to consider, and I, I really strongly urge you, a lot of affiliate managers come in and start managing an affiliate program, and they don't even ask the question like, I just want to know, look at the integration, know about the integration, talk to the affiliate vendor, are we, is there a better way to integrate? We have a lot of clients that track with us, and we start to see discrepancies in data, and we tell them it's because you've, you've kind of hamstrung, our, you're not getting the most out of our technology because you've kind of put it in a little box and it can't do what it's, what it's meant to do. Right. So let, let, let's say I've, I've done that, right? I've met with my team, I've met with all my vendors, I've, I've QA'd all the tags and, and I've made sure that my settings are, you know, aligning in terms of referral windows and, and, and other things like that. Uh, but even still, it's never, I'm never going to get these all to align hundred percent. Is there ultimately one dashboard that I need to be looking at uh, or am I constantly going to be marrying up these disparate sets of data? I see, I see a lot of companies have analysts pull data from lots of third parties and then they kind of figure out there's like a fudge factor that they come up with, you know, four percent fudge <laughs> factor. They kind of mush it together and create their dashboard. I think a better practice is to try to figure out a tool that can be um, your own internal database, it can be your analytics, it can be some third party tools, but find some product that you feel confident you, you are getting accurate apples to apples data across your marketing channels. And the idea is to have the whole team say that's the data we're gonna base it off of. You, know, you still have attribution, or, or I mean analytics, you still have the reporting out of your affiliate network. And those are good tools and you use those separately, but when you're looking at the the way that channels interact together and influence each other and your cost of sales, you all have to agree to believe in one reporting tool. And the goal is always to optimize your tracking and your settings to get the most accurate data there. Even if your affiliate tracking is a little wrong, uh, you can still use that data to make decisions, but this is where you're gonna get you know, your, your purest, you know, most accurate data. The, um, and a lot of companies I know have their own internal databases and they've spent a lot of money and, and built out really good tools and information there. Um, some people do use their analytics and it depends on the analytics that you have. And again, there's a lot of nuances there. Even the way your analytics were implemented can prevent you from getting good data. 
Some tag management tools give you some reporting, but I wouldn't use that as a dashboard. But these are third party, party tools that you'll be using to implement and get this data accurate. And then typically some type of attribution. And that can come through your own internal database and some analytics. But attribution, if, just so we're all on the same page, is really understanding all of the touch points from a, like a single conversion. So it went through paid search, it went through SEO, it went through an affiliate, it went through another affiliate, and then they converted. Really understanding who all is involved in, in it. So that's really what you're trying to get when you, when you try to look at, uh, try to really analyze the value of all your marketing channels because they all overlap at some point. And so, like I said, at the bottom, it's really important to get buy-in that we're going to use, this is the sacred data. We're going to try to believe this data more than the other data. Right. And, and so let, let's say I've done that, right? I, I've, I've got my single source. I've, I've QA'd everything. I'm, I'm confident that things are set up flawlessly. Uh, and I've compared those systems to this single source, and everything is matching up within a reasonable margin of error. Uh, I'm, I'm ready to start actually looking at the data. Can I start out day one and just start pulling insights from this? Yeah, so this is where it gets tricky. You know, when you, when you start, now you've, you put all this work in, now you're, everybody's ready to look at the data, or they're already looking at the data, and maybe you're new to the data. So the first thing I always tell people to do is don't trust the data for two reasons. One is if you're just starting to be able to analyze the data, your data set's going to be too small. So, you know, if you've got some uh, look-back windows or cookie windows of 30 days, and you've got maybe some buying cycles, you know it takes some customers 50 days to, from, you know, search to, to intent to purchase, going through all the, all the different uh, phases of, of making a decision to buy, you really need to get out to like two months of data to where it starts to make sense. So what I always recommend people do in the beginning is start to kind of just get a feel for the data in as small of bytes as possible and really try to see if some of the data doesn't make sense. The trap there is if I have two weeks of data, some of the data won't make sense, but it will in two months if I don't touch it. So trying to fix the data early can also cause it, you fixed it wrong, it was right or it was righter. So you, you kind of, I always like remember back to the movie The Matrix, you know, and the one guy was staring at the Matrix and all the green going down and another guy walks up behind him and goes, how can you see that? And, you know, it's like if you stare at it long enough, you know, you start to see, I think it's like blonde, brunette, redhead, you know, you can see something in all that. And, and that's really what happens with this data. You know, big data is, has a lot of drawbacks. I mean, you know, you get access to a lot of data and you need a tool and reports that allow you to kind of just peel away at it because the surface data may look right, you peel one layer away and it starts to look a little different. So, right, if you try to focus on everything, it's just noise, but if you zero in, right. you so, see some signal. Yeah, and you're trying to, you're just trying to like, you know, it's like suddenly the data starts to make sense to you because you've been looking at it long enough. I mean, if you think back to around, you know, the 2000s when site-side analytics came out, People were overwhelmed with that data. They didn't know what to do with it. Paid time on page and exit, you know, all this, nobody knew what that was and how do you, but people start using it all the time and they become familiar with it. And you could go into a new company today and they implement it and you're using that data right away. So this attribution style data is also something that you just need to get used to. And that's why I say, try to start high level and peel into it, take in small bites, question it, you know, make notes, um, you know, I've worked with um, BI engineers for years at the different companies I work at, and I ask for data all the time. I never believe it's right, because those guys just crank out a SQL query or whatever and go, here's your report. And you, know, you look at it and you go, how does that say that? You know, and then you go over there and you ask, and they go, oh, 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 I see what you want now. And you know, sometimes you go through that two or three times. So you know, you're trying to understand the data and question it and look for discrepancies by channel and then look for the anomalies in the data that you can fix. And then, like I said, don't try to make decisions on the data. You're just getting used to it. Because if you start making decisions off the data too soon, and the other thing I would say is that this data is kind of subjective when you get into attribution, because you're placing value on everybody that's involved. I could value the second to the last click way more than everybody else in this room, depending on who it is. So it, you know, it, there's so many pieces that go into that. So, Again, if you're just new to an organization or your company is embracing this data and maybe your managers or your VPs or your CMOs are looking at this data, it's important for you to be looking at it too and like getting in that room and understanding it because they could easily 
jump to a conclusion about the affiliate channel, come down and ask you a question about it, and you're like, I cannot answer that with my affiliate reporting data, right? Or, but if you're familiar, you go, oh, I know why you see that, here's why, and you can explain it, or you can take the time to find out more answers. So that's a big piece of what we're talking about So I, I know, you know, in addition to, my takeaway from, the, from what you were saying before is, you've gotta give it time Right, to build a statistically valid data set. Mm -hmm. You've got to look at the data, see where there are some oddities in it, go back, fix it, allow some time to build another data pool, QA that, and then you know, begin to look at some trends. Were there any other, I mean, I know you, in terms of like looking at how channels interrelate with other channels, like we're actually starting to dig into the data. Where do I begin? Like what sort of questions, what sort of views of the data do I wanna actually begin to look at? Well, most people are always looking first at, you know, last click. So whoever's last click in is going to win. If paid search was the last click, they win. But if an affiliate was second to the last click, you know, what did they do to influence that purchase? Or vice versa, right? Paid search drove the second to the last click and affiliate was last. Or you have your email channel. So you're, you're, you're going to start looking for these common touch points and these common paths to conversions. And I think at the affiliate level, you want to include the affiliates alongside keywords and alongside, you know, marketing campaigns like an email or, or, or a, um, a retargeting campaign so that you can see the specific affiliates, not affiliate as a channel. Because individual affiliates, you know they have different business models, different content, different types of customers, demographics, things like that. So really trying to understand, again, high level, what are the more common? Not the, all of them, just some of the more common ones. You know, when people buy from... Uh, you know, affiliate A, they tend to do, go through a lot of search before they end up converting from affiliate A. Or, you know, affiliate B uh, loses out a lot to our paid search. Um, so really starting to understand that because the other key thing that you'll start to understand is, and I think this is really where I think affiliate marketing is getting more sophisticated. When you log into your affiliate networks, you value the affiliate based on last click. But if you could see all the clicks that they contributed to and the recency of those clicks, not 30 days ago, but maybe 30 minutes before the last purchase or last click, you start to understand when they were involved and did, you didn't pay them. And then let's say they were involved in 25% uh, more conversions than you paid them for, and you value those previous conversions at, I don't know, 10%. So that's ex essentially two and a half percent more contribution. So, you know, and, and if you're an affiliate, it's important to, to, to be able to kind of convey your value and understanding that you know you're sending them customers that they're not paying for, that you're part of that. Let me ask you one kind of specific scenario that I know comes up all the time when we're having this conversation about attribution and, and affiliate marketing specifically, coupon sites, right? It's, it's the scenario is someone comes to my site they see that, that coupon code field, they go to a coupon site, they, you know, they search, they find a discount code, they plug it in, they get a discount. How much, you know, did they really influence the sale or was it just sort of natural buying behavior that I'm just paying, giving them credit for anyway? Um, what are some different ways to look at that problem and, and really understand the, the nuance and the syntax there? Like to make the matrix uh, to start seeing the, the, the details in it. Well, I think there's a love-hate relationship, especially for retailers with, with a lot of the coupon and deal sites. You know, and I think people are trying to figure out, like, who's at fault? You know, is it the consumer? Is it the affiliate? Is it, is it the advertiser? I mean, if you think about it, if you're buying online and, and you're ready to push checkout and the advertiser's telling you there's one more field that's empty, and if you put something in it, you save money. It's really hard to be a consumer and go, no, I'm just going to, I don't want to save money. I don't want any more discount. I'm just going to click submit. So I think that's human behavior. Um, but when you, what you don't want to do is, A, bucket all of them in the same thing and you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. You want to figure out, okay, affiliate A, I want to figure out a way to get more value out of that affiliate. So I've got a couple good examples here. If you have an affiliate that's driving an $87 AOV, through coupons, maybe it's just 10% off. Uh, and you say, well, I wish I could get it to over 100. That would be better. I would be happy with that, even if the 
you know, they're coming in closer to the end. So maybe I'm going to change my 10% off coupon to 10% off $100 or more. Run that for a few weeks. Maybe my average order value now ends up being 118. So I'm like, okay, that worked. But now I'm still paying 10% on 118. So maybe if I try to test $10 off orders over 100, whether they buy 100, 200, I'm only paying 10 to the consumer. I mean, giving the discount. So it's testing those kind of things and really having that one-to-one -one communication about, with the advertiser about your concerns. You know, there's other things you can do, uh, rewarding for more for new customers or uh, maybe even bonusing uh, an affiliate that was second to the last click that may be more content oriented versus the last click, which a lot of times tends to be the coupon. You know, adjusting their commission rate, again, based on the value. And I think part of that picture is looking at when was a coupon site involved and not credited. You know, where, where are they creating brand and, and offer awareness uh, to the consumer? Uh, I think those are really important. So I've seen really good results just doing simple things like that is, you know, I, the goal is always, I mean, if I can say, I've got, we, you know, your boss comes down and complains about coupon sites and you go, yeah, but their average order value is like 25% greater than any other affiliate and, and it's the highest of all of our channels. Okay, that changes the conversation a little. I'm controlling the costs through the coupons by limiting it to $10 on 100 and our average order value is on 148. So there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of test and, you know, the idea is to kind of look at that on a per affiliate basis and, and not just say we're doing it with all affiliates because sometimes different affiliates, the behavior and the responses are different. And the last one that I think is really, really helping advertisers a lot is putting some type of promo code controls in place. I think the biggest fear that I hear from advertisers is just using promo codes on the internet is kind of you know, it's like me setting down a ferret right now. We might not ever see it again, right? It just, it's gone. And you can put a promo code into somebody's, you know, in mailbox right, on direct control. mail, and it's all over the Internet. So it's, t it's hard to figure out how, what to do about this. And I've talked to advertisers who say, I, I don't want to, we, we try not to use any coupons at all anymore because it just became too wild. There are technologies, and I'll admit we have it, but um, that where you can, block promo codes that aren't allowed in the affiliate channel, so the consumer can still use them, the affiliate can't get credit for them. You can also credit specific publishers with a vanity or a, a unique promo code that they will only get credit for. So what that does is it allows you to block out like friends and family or birthday or email promo codes that you send direct to customers through direct mail or catalogs, email, uh, and other channels. Uh, which sometimes are even richer, right? You know, if, you're, if I'm a good customer and you send me, like on my birthday, a 25% off coupon, you don't want the affiliate who's getting 8% to also, you know, now, now you're, you're not happy with that. So I think trying to put some promo codes, and there's lots of ways to do it, um, really does help to kind of wrangle that down. And it helps, you know, people above the affiliate channel understand that, you know, that we have controls in place, we're looking at this data, we're monitoring it, we've worked to, you know, limit our exposure on the coupons and up our AOV. You know, these are all goals that we're constantly trying to evolve. In. Another question actually just popped into my head. Retargeting, which we mentioned earlier. A lot of the retargeting companies say, well, you have to give credit to the view. Is there a way to, you know, use attribution modeling systems to understand the value of the view? Yeah, I mean, a lot of media that you buy on a CPM basis, they want to get credit on view-throughs because unfortunately, you know, display media does not perform and the only way they get you to keep buying it is if they can get right. credit on a view-through. So but there is some, there's some value. Little secret, but, huh? There's some value to the view, right? Depends. Arguably. If the, if the view creates a conversion within 12 or 48 hours, I would say yes. If it's seven days, I can't imagine any impression that I saw seven days ago is in my head, I got too many things I'm already forgetting. <laughs> right. So I think I think with retargeting, it's it's a little bit smarter, and there's lots of different retargeting. You know, there's a email where they email the customer back a deal, right. and hey, here's what you left in your cart, and you didn't check out. And there's now a deal. Um, there's just plain old follow you around the internet and hope I don't creep you out. I would say if you are doing retargeting, the one thing that I see not happen enough is communicating with the retargeting company that a conversion the customer did buy to turn off the retargeting. Because I even see myself still getting retargeting after I already bought from that advertiser. So you're wasting impression dollars and you're probably really creeping the customer out now. 
because it doesn't stop. But um, the other thing I think that's interesting, I don't know if there's any retargeting companies here, but in, in Europe, a lot of the retargeting companies are in the affiliate channel. And that's something that I'm starting to see a little bit in the U.S., more and more types of businesses outside of what people think of a, a normal affiliate are coming into the performance marketing channel. And so it's important that, you know, you have tools that allow you to implement like a retargeting publisher. If they join your affiliate program, they need to, they just don't need a pixel to fire on the thank you page. They need to be able to see the customer when, when they come into your site. So there's further integration. So if you have a tag management system or you work with us, we have ways to make that a lot easier. But that's a really, um, a, you know, if you're the affiliate manager, if you think about this, you want to try to get as much performance deals into your channel as possible, right? You're growing that channel. So if you can find performance marketing type uh, retargeting companies and, and technologies out there that can work on a performance basis, you know, you're bringing in new types of partners and you're mitigating the risk because you're only paying based on the performance. So, the, the, so you know, I've, I've, I'm now looking at the system, looking at the data, and I've looked at these scenarios, right? I've, I've, I'm peeling back the layers, like you said, and I've looked at the scenario where a coupon site is the last click, uh, but it was preceded by maybe clicks from other channels, and I've determined what I think is the fractional attribution that belongs to that coupon site, uh, and maybe I've looked at other scenarios, my retargeting, what's the value of a view, and I'm now confident I, I have a, a percentage in mind of, of the fractional attribution to that channel or that partner. What do I do with that now? So it's, there's two ways that you do it. One is you want to calculate the value per transaction, which I think is complicated and not necessarily the best way to do it. The other is if you can look at the overall value based on a channel, especially if we're looking at affiliates, so I'm looking at my top 20 affiliates, 10 affiliates, and now I understand their total contribution and value. I've got my team and our, sub, our collective subjective opinion of all the value that everyone's provided. And then you basically then look to adjust the, the overall rate based on all of that. You know, what percent are new versus returning? What percent of the conversions that an affiliate sends touches no other media? We call that solo contribution. I see affiliates out there that where 100% of their traffic is solo. That means that advertiser cannot get access to that, pub, that, that customer except through that affiliate. So if I were an advertiser, I'd place a pretty high value on that traffic, even if it's low traffic, you know, they're not my number one. So there's a lot of different things, you know, this, this affiliate, these two affiliates look identical to me, but this one has a higher AOV and this one sends me more, more new customers than the other. See? So a lot of affiliate reporting, you know, the old days was, you know, who sends the most sales can ask and get the highest commission. I think we're getting beyond that. We're trying to write the, the, the true value of, of that publisher based on how much overlap there is and, and other things that matter to the business, right? I, I said earlier, I think in the previous slide, um, I didn't get to, uh, which just, one? you know, model the data based on your, on your business model and objectives. You know, if you're, you have a quarterly objective of acquiring new customers, maybe it's just that quarter that you're, that's a really big thing and there's bonuses or just goals in, around that, you're going to kind of change your strategy on who, which affiliates you work with and you need to be able to see that data. If you can't see it, it's hard to do anything about it. Right. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that's important is, you know, if you only manage affiliate, you still want to know how search is influencing affiliate and how search is being measured against you if, you know, because you're kind of measuring your own business, you've got your own KPIs, they've got their own KPIs, but probably management or the organization is trying to have a more holistic view. And so you need to know both of those views. So you don't, you know, the last thing you want is someone coming down to your desk and go, hey, the new CMO started today and, you know, at his last job, he, he got rid of affiliate and they didn't miss a sale. Yeah. You're like, uh, uh. <laughs> You know, I think one thing too, maybe I, I would add, I, I know that, I know, for us, what's been, because we've used systems like this, and, and, and you, as you well know, and, and made decisions on it, um, but it, it, going back and retesting some assumptions. So for instance, if we've learned, let's say that, uh, you know, in, in, in the coupon site example, or better yet, a PPC example, right? Uh, affiliate drives uh, a click to your site, uh, in case, let's say, of a blogger, right? So they're early in the investigation cycle, top of the funnel type of click, high value click. 
but then later they come back to your site via Google through a search on your brand name, which they've really used as more of a navigation aid as opposed to going back and doing more research on, say, like a generic term. Uh, and so you look at it and you say, well, you know, we're going to go ahead and just uh, 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 discount the affiliate sale because of w in that interaction. Uh, well, one thing you could do is turn it off and find out. Look at two sets of data. Look at when uh, paid search assisted the affiliate sale and when it did not. And what's the difference in conversion rate? And that way you know. Right? So you, can, you have a, 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 a balanced sample with both. And, and if there's actual lift, then you know that that's the percentage to fractionally attribute to that particular you, partner. You know, another part to that, I hear more and more advertisers really valuing the blog content sites. You know, they de tend to send the less traffic, but they really like that type of content out there. And there's really good bloggers, and you know, especially you know, you get kind of these mommy bloggers and, and savvy shopper bloggers and things like that. They don't end up always being last click. I've seen advertisers do analysis on those types of publishers and easily be able to say, I could pay them 100% of sale. And when I look at my overall cost of sale, the overall commissions as a percentage of sale, it hardly moves that needle maybe a half a percent or a percent. So now you've suddenly given, or, or even just go, going back to a blog after you've seen some of the sales that they've sent and that they didn't get credit for, and just doing a, a make good. Hey, here's $100. I really appreciate that last blog you did. You don't know what that does to that person. They're like, you know, this company just noticed me, and I've only sent them 10 sales this month, and they just gave me 100 bucks because now guess how much more blogging they're going to do about your brand. So it's really kind of being strategic about this and really focusing on, because I think advertisers get nervous of having this kind of concentration of like maybe 25 publishers that are driving 95% of the volume, and they want to be more diversified. But, you know, if we were talking eight years ago, uh, there wasn't, your top 25 publishers were probably all going to be paid search arbitragers. So, you know, it evolves. Right. And, you know, the coupon and deal and loyalty, I think, are resonating with consumers, obviously. And, and you know, it's just really, like I said, trying to right, side, right size what you're doing with them and then trying to figure out all these other contributors and how to kind of grow that. Right. I don't and, think it's ever going to replace that, but it's certainly going to be and, and, uh, more and valuable to your brand. The landscape's constantly changing, your promotion's changing, your site's changing. Oh, yeah, nothing Got stays it. the same. Right. So, yeah, All just right. keep looking at the data. So, yeah, <laughs> I think in, in, in summary then, the, the, the kind of key takeaways for me were you start out by developing that blueprint, that roadmap for exactly how all the interactions across all the channels are gonna, are gonna work. What are the you know, relative uh, referral windows? What are the uh, conditional firing rules? Let me just say just how quick you could make one because if I put one up there, it's kind of messy, but I use a spreadsheet. I put the channels down the left. I put the sub channels of each channel down the right and maybe obviously with affiliate, you're not gonna put everyone in there, but you would know at affiliate level. The next, I would put, or a group of affiliate, right? Like coupon sites. Yeah, you could also have t subtypes, and then and then obviously you're going to measure each one individual. So you're not going to do that out to the long tail. You're probably going to just focus on your top, top ones, right? Then the next, I would put how are we tracking them? What tool and and any dependencies? Because what you're trying to look for is where can things break and not work right? Right? That's what you're. That's what and everybody's looking at it. And then what's our what's our rule on? Can an affiliate? Um, be second to the last click and paid search be last click and the affiliate get credit? Does, does our pixel fire then? Or if we have two affiliate networks, are, is it ever the case that the same order ID tracked in both? So you want to map all that out if it's happening. Then you have a constructive conversation with your team and your agency. Right. What do we want it to be? So first you want to map out what it is or what it could be because maybe you haven't implemented everything. And then you want to know, what do, is this right? Right? We've been doing it this way forever. Okay, but that doesn't make it right, right? There might be a better way to do it. I see a lot of advertisers that run on multiple networks that aren't deduping. Maybe it's only 5 or 10% uh, of orders that would get corrected, but that's still an added cost. That you, I don't think anybody believes it's fair and should so be paid. Think about that for a second. You've got, it, it could be even the same affiliate. It could be in multiple different networks sending you one sale and getting paid three times for it. I mean, that, that has to... It happens. I mean, I see affiliates, they registered in 98 in Affiliate Network A, and they sign up at Impact Reyes, and they, they've, you know, it's a different name, right? right? They don't go by that name, but they don't change it. So 
you can't even always, sometimes you just have to know that that company is that company, right? Like a lot of people think of Whale Shark Media, but they don't go by that anymore, right? It's Retail Me Not, so. Right. But they signed up as Whale Shark Media, and it still says Whale Shark. Right. So. All right, so we, we built out our blueprint, and, we don't, and it, it could be a simple spreadsheet, but you know, detailed enough so that when could be folks- a workflow diagram, whatever you, tool you like both. To play with. Yeah, both, right. both. So that if someone leaves the organization, all of that intelligence, all that thinking isn't lost. Right, it's written down. If you ever want to audit this, you can go back and point to it. Well, uh, here's the other thing. I've seen a lot of cases where, all right, I'm the marketing manager. You're my dev guy. And I go, okay, i got to get this tag put on the site. And you go, oh, I can get it in in the next sprint. Okay, great. But I, don't want you, I need to go on this part of the page, and it only has to fire under these conditions. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a tag management solution, but he's a smart guy. <laughs> so we kind of talked about it. Impact radius, and, please. All right, Help. sent him an email, right? And so he read it, and he did it. And now I start looking at the data and I'm going, this, this looks low or wrong, right. right? Or affiliate complaints or whatever. And so then you go into him and you start talking about it. Well, I can't look at his code and know that he made a mistake or he interpreted what I said wrong, right? Right. So that's where you get a lot of problems. I mean, we're constantly. When you start trying to like code online. the logic But if you in have it every scenario out and it's pretty clear and you can sit down with that person and go, here's what we're doing, here's all these things, and this is what we're we want to happen here. Right? That's, how that, that's how you eliminate the mistakes, the okay. blueprints. So we, we, we've got our blueprint, then we've determined the integration and the tracking requirements. We select our, our tool. We determine what's going to be the single source that we're going to focus on. Data starts coming in, looking at it in small bites, peeling away the layers, giving time to build a data set, and then making informed decisions and, and retesting assumptions. And I guess ultimately now that we've defended our channel and, and proved our value, we can go to our our bosses and ask for a raise. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, I, I always say this, the, the, you know, the affiliate channel provides a lot of value. There's a lot of large, large brands that that channel is still 15% of sales. And the difference between affiliate and all other marketing is all other marketing, you got to keep pressing on the gas pedal. You, you, every buy, everything you do is kind of a, a, a spend and then it's off and then spend. Affiliate is always constant. You know, you, you don't, it doesn't just come and go. I mean, there's certainly seasonality. So it's a very constant, reliable channel. And what you want to do is make it as valuable to your company as possible, understand the value, and constantly optimize the value so that when you have those conversations with a VP or a CMO and, and they want to know more about, you know, different types of publishers, you can show, look, here's what we've done. Here's where they were. They had a really low AOV. We were giving them these big coupons and paying them a really high commission because they were our number one affiliate. But we've looked at the overall value, and here's the evolution. Here's where they are now. And here's all the improvements we've made. You know, that, that goes a long way to where, you know, somebody just comes in with a sword and wants to slash at things and, and kind of just make assumptions. And, and that happens a lot. It's a good analogy. It's, the, it's using a scalpel instead of a hacksaw. Yeah. Right? So we've got some time left. I. I does anybody want to, you know, we've got this opportunity, anybody want to ask some questions or about attribution or tag management? Or affiliate. Or affiliate in general. Is anybody doing it now? Does anybody ha actively have a, a tag management attribution system in place today? Or more of a corporate dashboard where you're looking at all the data across everything. Do you get insight to that as well? A little bit. Yeah. And what, what um, even if you don't have a platform in place, have you started to look at, has anybody started to look at the relationship between different channels and trying to think strategically about whether there's some overlap, whether we're, you know, because ultimately, I, I know everybody's gotten into this scenario. You look at your data and you say, okay, my bid management system tells me I've got a thousand orders. My affiliate uh, network tells me I did uh, a thousand orders. And uh, you know, organic SEO, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking 1,000 orders there, so I should have 3,000 orders. But when I look at my e-commerce database, there's only 2,500, right? Surely- Or 4,000. Right, <laughs> well, hopefully it's four. I'll take yeah. four. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, what, you know, has anybody seen that experience happen? Okay. I'm assuming you have, but you don't yeah. have to say yes. Well then, you know what, I think it's worth taking a look because I suspect it is happening. You may not even be aware. And so hopefully uh, what you've heard today maybe 
get you thinking in that way and, 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 and start looking at, at your data in this, in this perspective? Well, it's really just about having the conversation in the office. You know, how are we looking at all this data? How does search and affiliate, do we, is that it? They do their thing and I do my thing and maybe we'll have lunch. <laughs> right. I mean, it's got to, you know, be more. Yeah, question. Do you have a good way to do offline attribution uh, for online traffic? So like GNC's sales, for example? So they're sold in another store? Or? Yeah, like brick and mortar. So how would you give a conversion attribution for that offline? Are they your products being sold by GNC or right. your GNC? It's tough when it's a third, another company's commerce, unless you know you work. There are some. Um, what's that company that didn't Google just buy that company? Or that, there's a company up in the Bay Area uh, that does all that supply chain or, or distribution between. But that's tough. I mean, you can measure offline advertising that's driving traffic to either your uh, website or to your point of sale if you had your own retail. Uh, and then driving traffic from the web into retail stores if your point of sale system you know gets into the same database or can you know different companies i mean have different point of sale systems but i think most companies see now the holy grail is a, a more integrated database where they can an affiliate can drive a consumer into the store they use a coupon or, or a rebate or whatever make the purchase and that tracks back to them and likewise we see aff affiliates now doing a lot of offline marketing, uh, word of mouth, print, um, and even uh, you know, more social media with unique tracking values as opposed to tracking links, which you know, can, you know, if I tell you to go to advertiserx.com, you don't have to click on the link to use the promo code that's right next to it. You can just type it in and use it. So you don't want that breakage. So syncing all that up. But you know, it depends on all the moving pieces. Do you have a question? We did a low-tech solution on that one because a lot of times the retailer's not passing you that customer information at all. They just here's the quantity of units sold and that's it. Your end of story. Um, Whole Foods is another example that, that we were able to go in and say, okay, for instance, for baby formula, it was a very high-end baby formula they sell on Whole Foods. We actually short-coded it through an SMS standpoint. So every single person that came back through that short code on that keyword, we knew was absolutely no questions asked. They picked up the can of Whole Foods and they bought it. Even the Whole Foods is never passing that information back. You, as the merchant or as the advocate, as the product holder, now has direct communication to that, to that person, which otherwise you can't see that communication. But an SMS side would be a piece of the mm -hmm. Yeah, or even like a, an app that scans or something, you know. Let me ask, ask you guys another question. It, who, I'm sorry, uh, I thought maybe you raised your hand. Uh, how many? people are managing programs in more than one affiliate network? Like in a couple, yeah? So are you, are you looking at a set of order IDs for all your orders that came from Linkshare and another set of order IDs for all your orders that came from uh, Commission Junction? Networks. And you, just you stacking do? them up? Do you dedupe them? Right now I have all of them together, but they have a each transaction have one ID. So if I get an ID liquidated, I have a picture as to know which one does it. Okay. So that you have a click ID, so you figure out which is the last, yeah. Okay. Good. You just do that manually? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're down to 15 minutes, so if <laughs> I knew I was going to be fast. All right. Well, we, you know, we're here for the next couple of days. If anybody has any questions afterwards, or there's another. I think, you know, it depends on your business and it depends on the size of your business and, and the complexity of the attribution that you want to do. There's products out there that, you know, they got to back a semi truck up to your, to your business to unload and then there's really light, simple stuff. So it really depends on what you're looking for in attribution, um, you know, kind of all shapes and sizes. Um, and it, and it, you know, a lot of times it has buy-in across the company as to what the tool is. And what you sometimes I, people find out is that they do have attribution somewhere. Some other department got right. it and is using it, you know, some other channel or something. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things you got to kind of 
figure out what's right for you. Just like tag management, there's different tag management solutions. They're all similar, but not all the same. Which one's right for you? And, and I can tell you some of the considerations that we've had, when, and, and every organization is different. We're an agency, so we have to deal with the needs of multiple different organizations. And across the board, the kinds of considerations that come up in that conversation are, well, it would be really nice to have something that uh, is already offered by or uh, tightly integrated with our current analytics system. But on the other side, and what's really important to me as a marketing manager uh, is, you know, I, I want to make sure that it's tightly integrated with the system that's going to be paying my partners, right, and managing those relationships. And uh, so I think looking for a system that has, that integrates the, uh, the analytical side of the attribution and the tag management, so the actual functional aspects of that, but ties it in with some kind of a partner management component as well, I think is, is a key consideration, at least in my book. Another thing that, that made me think of, I, I was working with an advertiser one time, and they used, I forget what analytics product they used, but their CEO said that's, that's the law, that whatever the sales are in that, win. And they were working with another affiliate network, and they were off by like over 25% against the team that managed the affiliate channel. So all their bonuses, all their goals were being measured by, by this one tool, and, and this tool, they couldn't get them in sync. So they weren't, they weren't getting credit for all the sales that they were truly driving. You know, they had a reporting in the affiliate network that showed higher sales, but they were stuck using this. So part of what we were kind of talking about in the beginning is you want to try to get everything to be as close to saying the same numbers as possible, realize that it never will be 100%. But the challenge with picking the tool that is going to rule is, is it hurting you? <laughs> you know what I mean? How can I fix that problem? How can I get the data back in there so that it is accurate? There's a lot of uh, analytics tools. You can't, like, batch in missed transactions and things like that. You can't correct it. It just records it, and it's done. So it's another kind of consideration in looking at the data. That's a good point. All right. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot.